wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls. Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You It's always hunger for, oh, our hearts always hunger for. Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own, here in our weakness you find. Falling before your throne Oh, we're falling before your throne You are the one that we praise You are the one we adore You give the healing and grace Hearts always hunger for, oh, our hearts always hunger for. <clears throat> Thou art strong, Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to Thee, just a closer walk with Thee. toil and snares. If I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. Just a closer walk with thee.
I think we do. I hope so. I generally have two come in twice a day, morning and evening, on my phone. So our phones aren't just problems all the time. There's good things to do with them. And I wanted to share this morning's one with you because I thought it was so fitting. We have a nice crowd today. We still have empty spaces, but we still have room. Hint, hint. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And I think that's rather fitting that we... Uh, we really focus on supporting one another, loving one another. The love that we express for one another as brothers and sisters of Christ will be the evidence to the world that God is real. We as Christians already know that God is real through the faith that we have. The love that we show each other will strengthen our bond in the faith and encourage more people to come to Christ. And uh, let's remember that in our everyday actions and how we uh, live our lives. We're going to sing a song today, of course, for you that will remind you that as believers in Christ, even in the valley, even in the valley in him, 
we have blessings and we have many good things that come our way. that song. Uh, turn with me to James chapter 3. We're going to continue in James 3 today. We've been, we've been talk, walking through James, and uh, so we're on chapter 3. For those of y'all taking notes, that's the official halfway mark. So uh, we will uh, we'll continue it for the next however long it takes us to finish it, uh, but we are halfway through. But I want to open this up in prayer, and then we're going to look at um, a passage that, um, if it steps on your toes, um, then, well, welcome to James, because he's been doing that a lot, it seems like. But let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the day. We thank you again for the opportunity to open your word. We thank you that it's not just some book, but it's it's your story to us. It's it's your living word to us. And as we approach... Um, James and the topic of our speech and how we talk to one another. I pray that you do convict us of our sin, that your Holy Spirit moves in our hearts, but also uh, encourage us to, to do better and to, to encourage one another to do better. And just as our brother Bruce mentioned, to, to help us to know to spur one another on to love and good works. We thank you for this passage and I pray that it's, again, it's your words and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, as kind of in, in preparing the, the sermon, I always kind of like to think about, like, what's a good opener? What's a good story? And, and, and the, what we're reading about in, in James is, is he uses the uh, illustration of a rudder that we'll read about here in a second. And it got me thinking, my number two, Ethan, he's going to be our engineer. Um, there's a few things he could be. I'm, I'm praying for engineer because some of the other options could be politician or drug lord or lawyer. Um, <laughs> 
He could go on one of a different, a lot of different directions. Uh, whatever he does, he's going to be very successful at it. I know. Um, so that's why I'm hoping it's good. But anyway, but no, he he hit that airplane phase. Um, I think every young boy, and I'm sure a lot of girls do this too. But I grew up with boys, so we hit the age where we want to make paper airplanes, and we want to make them faster, and make them fly larger, and make them do tricks and all sorts of things. And he loves the trick planes. That's like his thing. He wants them to do crazy stunts and stuff. If it lands behind the fridge, that's a that's a success kind of thing. And so as we're as you know as we're talking about all this, and I'm showing him how to fold different ones because you know I went through that phase too. One of the things I showed him, I said, "Hey, look, if you if you just rip the wing a little bit and you make a flap on it, I said then you can make it. I said you can make it go up, make it go down, make it do barrel rolls, all sorts of stuff. Just depending on how you bend these flaps, which he thought was just amazing. And so of course we had to do that and he. So if most of the time he'll he'll ask me to make the paper airplane, but he's he's gotten to where he'll do it himself too. But it's really funny to think about because you you design this whole plane right, and it works with big planes too. You design this whole plane, but that one little flap on the wing just changes everything, right? I don't know how many of y'all have flown a lot. I love flying. Uh, I would love to be a pilot, but I'm too broke to do the pilot's license route. Um, but the flaps on it, right, it's just it's crazy to me. Because, I mean, that's just up, down, barrel roll. All that happens because this one little bitty change in the aircraft. And that's it's really what James is talking about here through the passages that we're going to read. It's just, it's one small change. It's one small organ in our body. But it drives everything that we do. And it really can, I mean, it alters the entire course of our lives if we can just make this one little change. So what are we talking about? Well, let's read... James 1, and we're going to read through verse 5, but we're actually going to stop in the middle of verse 5. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So we're kind of starting a new thought, right? And, and James has, has picked up this idea of, of watching your tongue before in chapter 1, um, but here he's kind of helping reinforce and come back into it. And we know it's a new thought because for those of y'all that, you know, if you've read through and when you get to the end of chapter 2 and then verse 1 of 3, it's like, well, that kind of seems to come out of nowhere. What's going on there? Well, it's because it's a new thought, right? And verse 3, 1 does seem a little out of place because he, he talks about teachers and warnings about not everybody should be teachers. Now, I know for some of y'all are like, well, we just prayed that we'd have more Sunday school teachers. So does this mean I have an out because James just said I shouldn't try to be a teacher? No, you don't have an out. What he's saying is not many of you should be teachers because a lot of y'all can't keep your mouths straight, right? James said that, not me, just so if y'all looking at me funny, right? Uh, and, and the same way with us, right? Like, again, as a, as a pastor, as a teacher, like, you guys expect me to keep my mouth in check and say things in loving ways and not say it out of anger or spite or whatever else. That's what you expect out of me, right? If you go to the public school... You expect the teachers there to be nice and to be loving and to always be motivating and encouraging. And you get really mad when those teachers yell at your little baby because your little baby could never do anything wrong. Well, I'm sorry, that's a lie. They're, your baby does wrong, just like everybody else. Um, and that was one of the things that I got frustrated as a teacher. I was never allowed to have a bad day. Um, and I, it just, I mean, I'm like, well, sometimes I have bad days and my kids are going to hear about it because they're teenagers and they're old enough to hear about it. I don't scream at little ones, but teenagers, they're old enough. They can handle it especially when they have a coach that will yell and cuss at them. That was the difference I never understood. My ADHD just kicked in right there. But I'm just saying, if you're allowing your coaches to yell and scream at your kids, you should not be mad at your math teacher or your biology teacher or whatever. But anyway, that's a whole other sermon another day. Moving on. Guide your tongue, right? Like, keep those things in check is what he's saying there. But he's, he notices, look, he says that it's, it's a small member, but it does so much. And that warning about not many should be teachers, it's linked to the topic. Right? Why is it that there's a requirement to be a Sunday school teacher? Or why is it that we have standards for those that we put in charge of people? Well, because, one, we know that they're judged at a, at a higher standard, like God says that, that's in the Word. But two, also, these are representatives of uh, the church, right? They're representatives of whatever organization. If, if, if you talk to me about being a Sunday school teacher, and, and we talk about it, like I'm putting you in a position to have 
influence over others. And so, yeah, I do expect you to do well. And I'm glad we have great teachers that do really well here in Sunday school. And for those of y'all that are like, well, I don't know about that. Well, I understand that, uh, you know, trepidation about <coughs> stepping up and taking a leadership capacity. But keep in mind that this verse isn't an out for you as a Christian because we all have our spheres of influence. There's, there's somebody in your life that looks to you as a, um, an example or as, as, a, as a, somebody that I can go to for advice and that sort of thing. Um, but even at a very basic level, we all interact with people, and there are opportunities to either be a blessing or be a curse. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, again, the, the teaching aspect, we don't focus on that too much because really what he's, he's bringing together this, this whole point, that part of Christian maturity is, is learning when to speak, right? So the point in your bulletin there, wisdom and maturity require us to discern when to speak, what to say, and when to be quiet. There are times you should just, shh, you know, be quiet. Um, this, this conversation happens a lot with, with students. Um, constantly, I'm, as I'm talking with them, I'll get onto them for one thing, and then they start talking back, and I'm like, listen, right now, your level of trouble is like way down here. But if you keep talking, you're going to keep climbing that ladder. Uh, with your kids, right? When you're getting onto your kids, they start talking, and you're like, listen, I wasn't going to hit you a minute ago, but you're getting there close now, right? Like, this is, this is what happens. So keeping our tongues in check, like that's part of just being wise and part of growing up and maturing is understanding. So when we think about the salvation process that James has been describing, he's bringing us around to, all right, Christians, listen, if you are to mature in Christ, part of that is getting your tongue under control and where it should be, right? So wisdom and maturity requires to discern what to speak. So uh, you can kind of think about times when you won't yourself have gotten in trouble, right? Like, what did you say during those times where you knew you were in trouble, right? Did you escalate the situation or did you kind of bring it back down with what you said or didn't say? Those are things to think about. And, and, <clears throat> and it's easy to pick out others, right? Like, it's easy to pick on teenagers just because teenagers are teenagers and we love to pick on them. But the truth is there are 40 and 50-year-old and older adults that do the same thing. We just, sometimes we just said that one word too many when we should have stopped. Um, and, that's, and that's what James is talking about here, that we have to control our tongues if we're to be wise. So there's an acronym that gets passed around a lot, and, um, and, and you've probably seen it in other places too. I think it's helpful. That's why I put it in the bulletin. Um, but, you know, the think before you speak acronym, right? So T, is it true? Is, am, I, am I about to say something that's true, or am I going to keep spreading lies, right? Honesty is always the best policy. That's just the way it is. But always be honest. Is it true? H, is it helpful, right? A lot of times we just like, well, I'm just speaking the truth. That may be right. Like, you might be right in what you're saying, but is it really helpful to say that right now, right? There are times when, yes, you should speak truth, but Jesus also said speak it in love, and part of that is being helpful in how you say things. So if it's not helpful, just shush, right? Um, I, is it inspiring? This one, like, are you actually encouraging people and inspire them to do better, or are you just encourage them to, to bring each other down, that sort of thing? And is it necessary? This is one that time and time again, like reinforce. I understand you have something to say, but right now it's very unnecessary, right? When, uh, we're, we're dealing with the whole talking during mealtimes thing. And I know some of y'all are like, you should let your kids talk during mealtime. It's not that they're not allowed to speak. It's that if we let them speak, they use their mouth for this and they don't chew anything. And like when we're at a restaurant or something, it's like, dude, we're ready to go, but you still got a full plate because you've been talking the whole time. Like, that's, that's just something we're working on, right? Learning timing. Like, I don't mind having a conversation. Just eat your food too, right? So anyway, but is it necessary, right? Is what you have to say actually necessary for what's going on? And then last K, is it kind? And, and this is where, again, for those of y'all that are wondering, well, Pastor, where are you at in this? Because I know you're not perfect. You're right. I'm, and the last question is the one I usually have to ask myself. Is what I'm saying actually kind to somebody? And I know y'all are like, do you have a mean streak? Yeah, I kind of do. Because I don't always do the helpful part, right? I skip the helpful part and go straight to the truth part. And some people don't like that. And it's fine. I get it. But, you know, we have to be think about what we're saying and how we're saying it, right? And why is that? Well, it's because the tongue is such a powerful force. It's this little thing in our bodies, and yet it controls so much with what we do. 
And, and I know some of y'all might think the acronym's kind of hokey, but it help, it's helpful. I know James would agree with this, right? Our tongues can steer our whole bodies, right? If, that, if that's true, which it is, then how we use that is very important. And we have to be careful about how we're using that, right? So sometimes we think of our words as nothing more than like fleeting things. Well, I just, I just said something. They're just words, right? The whole sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? Well, for those of y'all that are like, well, they just need to toughen up. Maybe so, but you could also soften up. I mean, that's, there's, there's a point, right, where you're no longer just being truthful. You're being a jerk. And this is where wisdom comes into play and working that out, right? Um, but the point for James, of course, it's not how to win friends and influence people. It's about where we're steering ourselves and others, right? Think about his illustrations. He talks about steering a horse and steering a, 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 a ship. So where are we steering our bodies? This is really what it boils down to. Like if we think about that salvation process, again, so Christ has come, he saved us, he died on the cross for our sins, he rose again. When we believe that in our hearts, when we confess that with our mouths and we're saved, that begins that process of salvation where we're growing and maturing and being more like what God has designed us to be. Well, that process uh, is driven on our part by our tongues, by how we talk to one another. And I know that seems kind of odd, right? Like, how is it that my speaking can dictate where my life goes? Well, think about it. Everything that you do, right, it starts in your head, and then it goes out your mouth. Well, technically, it's in your heart, then head, then out your mouth. But all that, that begins that process. So if you think about the things that people get trapped in, different sins, addictions, habits, etc., whatever, Typically, it starts with conversations with mouth, with your mouth, right? Somebody has influenced you to go in that direction, and so then you're driving yourself in that direction. You're influencing somebody else to go in a particular direction. So as church people, that hopefully we're all in agreement that we're on our way to heaven and that that's, that's our goal is to be more heaven-like here on earth, then as we influence one another, the question we have, are, are we driving each other towards love and good works as Hebrews reminds us to, or are we driving each other towards more gossip or more destruction or more hate or more whatever? And it all boils down to is how are we using our tongues, right? And whenever we see somebody step out, right, and then we catch them in sin that they're, they're doing those things that are bringing hell on earth, right, then when we use our tongue to, to chastise that, to discipline that, right, to say, no, look, what you're doing is wrong. You have to stop especially as a person of God, right? You, you cannot continue to do these things. That's using your tongue wisely. And that's what James is talking about, that we're driving the body of Christ in a direction. Hopefully that's heavenward. And where that begins is with each of us as individuals learning to keep our own tongues in check. So the last point there, uh, what we say will drive our lives towards faithfulness or away from faithfulness, depending on how we use our words. And it's, and, it, and it's not like the, the, the 21st century, you know, speak life to people. Just be positive all the time. It's not the New Age hippie nonsense that I'm talking about. It's just that practical, how are we influencing and guiding one another? And how, how are we interacting? Are we doing it in such a way that drives us towards faithfulness? Or are we driving ourselves away from faithfulness? Let's continue reading. Uh, we're going to read the finish of 5 and then go into 12. James writes, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So James condemns the tongue here. There's really no redemption in the eyes of James for, for the human tongue. Like nobody can, can tame this thing. He talks about a small spark is all that's needed to start a forest fire, and the, the tongue is like that small flame, right? If you grew up watching Smokey the Bear uh, commercials, right, you know just, just one little spark can cause a whole forest fire. Uh, very true in drought, you know, California right now. It doesn't take much to start 
and entire acres upon acres of fire. Think about this. It doesn't take much to start a fire in the church, and I do mean that metaphorically. I mean, just one person saying something wrong, and then that gets somebody else saying something wrong, and then that goes there, and then that goes there, and then pretty soon, all of a sudden, everybody's arguing about the color of the carpet, and that's not really what the problem is. But And then the church becomes divided over silly things, but it really boils down to the fact that because they have, they've been divided for a long time. It's just, there's just something else added onto it. And it's just one little thing because somebody just says something wrong. And the, the sad part is Jesus already had a fix for that a long time ago. If somebody offends you in some way, if somebody sins against you in some way, you go straight to them, right? You squash the fire out before it spreads. You go straight to the fire and you say, look, this is what happened. This is, this is what you did, whether you intended it or not. This, this is you know, how I felt about it. And you hash it out. Now, for those of y'all that are like, well, what if they don't listen? Jesus had an answer to that too. If they don't listen to you, you go find somebody else, just one person, right? Not a whole Facebook load of people. But you go find one person, and you go with them two on one. And you say, look, this is what's going on. That third party is there to help kind of mediate and figure out who's at, who's at fault and who's not at fault. And probably both of you are at fault, let's be honest. But, you know, to help that out. And if you still can't work it out, well, that's when you get the whole church involved. And that's when we as a church discuss the matter and deal with it. That's the process that Jesus laid out. And he did that on very much on purpose. Because, in, I don't know about y'all, but in my experience, if people would just go straight to the source of their problems and just deal with it there, it'd be done and over with. I'm, I'm fascinated by the number of times I've seen just giant catastrophes of conflict in relationships when it really boils down to somebody just said something dumb and they hadn't even thought about it since. But we allow 20, 30, 40 years to go by and we're still mad because they said that one thing way back when. That, long, that person has long forgotten about it. For those of y'all that are harboring bitterness in your hearts because somebody said something dumb 20, 30 years ago, just so you know, they don't even care anymore. They've long forgotten about it. So forgive them. Move on. It's, I mean, be honest with these things. And this is what James is talking about, being honest and just saying, look, control your mouth and understand what's going on. Notice he says like, that we've tamed all these different creatures, and yet nobody can tame the tongue. I got a picture here. This is my favorite animal, if you were ever curious. Both of them, I don't care. They're kind of the same species, sort of, not really. Uh, depends, on, depends on which scientist you argue with. You have the wolf, which is great and gallant, wonderful creature, um, but he's also very mean, and you don't really want to hang out with him. He's not, you don't scratch his belly and and pat his head and that sort of thing. You don't play ball with wolves because um, they don't play well with others, right? But then you have the dog on the right side there. Love dogs. Favorite pet, always have, always will. I have two right now. Um, the, the, the wolf to dog story is super fascinating. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that humans tamed wolves a long, long time ago and that's how come we have dogs. Okay, some of y'all aren't raising your hand because you don't like this participation thing. This is mainly me. Or you know that there's a trick question coming on and you don't want to, you're like, I'm not going to raise my hand because I know there's a twist coming. There is a twist coming. There's actually new research, like there are scientists that are making the argument that actually wolves are the ones that domesticated humans. Now, for those of y'all that are like, that's silly talk. Who picks up whose poop? <laughs> Just saying, all right? If aliens ever came, we would not be considered the ones in charge. I'm convinced of that. But no, like, so the story goes, right, that, the, there, were, there were wolves that were bold, but they were mean, and, and humans smacked them around and killed them. But there were also wolves that were bold, but they were kind of like, you know, these guys have leftover food, so maybe we should, like, buddy up with them. And we actually learned empathy because of, of dealing with these animals, that humans learned how to empathize with one another and empathize with lesser creatures because of, because of wolves, because they came and hang out. And eventually they started changing their shape, and they started to have floppy ears instead of pointy ears, and, they, and their tails would wag and that sort of thing. Of course, then we got involved with, in the Victorian era and made really ugly-looking dogs. Um, but, you know, some of them are cute, but some of them not so much. Uh, generations of inbreeding, and you get all the different kinds of dogs. There you go. Uh, but it's funny because they all came from wolves, which I think is hilarious. I used to own a chihuahua, and I always looked at him and thought, there's no way this guy is descended from some timber wolf or something. But there you go, right? But they, no, but that's, I mean, this is, it's interesting to me, and I think it's a great illustration because dogs, to me, are the ultimate companion. I mean, you can train them to do anything. There are whole cultures that, like, it's part of their hunting system. There, there's actually a, a group in the Congo that they firmly believe they would all starve to death if they didn't have their dogs. Um, I mean, you just, like, you always have a dog. Like, you just can't not have a dog there. 
they're uh, of course they're the good lap dog and that sort of thing. But uh, for you farmers, I, I, you put them to work all the time. Hunters put them to work all the time. One of the funny stories about Brandy's papa is he raised hunting dogs and uh, he took a group hunting. One of them did not go and do his job, and uh, and a shot rang out in the woods and the dog did not make it back home. Uh, he was of the persuasion, if you don't work, you don't eat. And if you're not going to eat, I don't need to keep you around. Different generation, what can I say? But, I mean, that's, but these, these things work. They do great, wonderful things. Wolves, not so much, right? I mean, wolves are, are a terror to, to a lot of people. And that's, that's what happens with tongues, right? It's this duality. It's the same creature, and yet how they're trained, how they're dealt with, depends on what's going to happen. Like, pit bulls really aren't, inherently mean it's just they've been bred to be mean by a lot of people tongues aren't meant to be as evil as they are god did not design our tongues to go and curse others we just do that because of our sin god designed the tongue to be a blessing to people around you to be a blessing to other creatures around us so the point in your bulletin there right our speech has the power to bring great blessings or great curses depending on how we use it I mean, we can be fountains of blessings to people around us. We can speak life to people. We can show them the way. We can tell them about Christ. We can give them good things just by the words that we say. We can give them that encouragement and that emboldened you know, zeal. Like We can encourage one another to do great things just by our words. Or we can tear people down with just, just the same words. It's amazing to me. And it's all in what is said and how it's said. So it, it's got to be tamed, right? But how can we tame it? James says, right, he says, nobody can do this. But the answer is in those last few questions that he asks. He says, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? The answer is, of course, no, right? And he says, so a salt pond cannot yield fresh water. Now, that's not biology you know, or science lessons. He's making a point here. If you expect salt water from the ocean, right, you don't expect to go drink a, a cup of ocean water and be fresh. Well then how can we expect blessings and, and life from our tongues? We have to be transformed. It's part of that transformation process. There has to be an inward transformation. He's been driving at the same point for the last two and a half chapters. True faith brings true transformation both inside and out. One of the, one of the ways that we know that we actually are a Christian, that we actually are bound for heaven, is how we speak to people. That's why Jesus said they'll know us by our love for one another. If we go around just tearing each other apart, we go around insulting one another, gossiping and that sort of thing, we should not expect the world to be like, man, God must really love us because look at those loving people. No, that's not what they say. It's only when we forgive those that should not be forgiven. It's only that when we give encouragement to those that need that encouragement. It's, it's when the things that come out of our mouth are come from a changed heart. That's when the world knows that we're Christians. So everything begins with our tongue. It's a small change, but it's a, it's a huge drive for everything. And so today, I, I, I kind of want to end, the invitation I think is interesting because when we think about what it means to follow Christ, it all begins with a small step. And that step is to actually turn to Him and, and turn away from those sins and those things that have been killing us and turn towards those life. And Paul writes it this way in Romans 10, 9-10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Salvation itself begins with your tongue. By, but when you, we believe in our hearts that Jesus came from the dead, but we also confess with our mouths. So if you believe, if you've heard the story of Christ and you, and you think to yourself, yeah, I, I, think, I think that really did happen. I think he did die on a cross for my sins and I think he did rise again. Well, you're halfway there. The next step is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And that's not just a saying the words kind of thing. It's not a magic thing. It's actually saying it. You believe Jesus is Lord. He is in charge of my life. He is in charge of this world. And when we do those things, then we are saved and we begin that salvation journey towards heaven. But the warning on the flip side is, is just as clear. Because for those that are not bound to heaven, there's only one other alternative, and that is a condemnation in hell. And we know hell is bad because, I mean, the things that lead up to hell are not good. Death, destruction, divorce, broken relationships, 
All these things that happen because of our sin, it all it does is culminate into death eternal. So today, as we go into the invitation, Monica's going to lead us in a song. And if you want to know more about what it means to follow Christ and have eternal life, I'll, I'll be down front and we'd love to talk with you and, and pray with you. If this is the time you want to join the church and you say, hey, I just want to be a part of what's going on here, I, I can talk with you about that as well. But take time to consider what God has laid upon you. On the back of your bulletin, there's some questions you can look at and think through how it is that you've been using your tongue this week and how better can you use it this next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather. We thank you for your word from your servant, James. I pray that as we reflect on it, Lord, that we take an honest look at ourselves and, and an honest look with how we've been talking with others. For the person here that they've never trusted in you, they've never turned from their sin, I pray that you convict their hearts and help them to understand the seriousness of their sin and that those words are not just words, but they're steps towards hell. Lord, help those that are, that are Christians to, to realize that we, we, we need to continue towards maturity because others need to see Jesus. Others need to hear about the gospel and the good news. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to convict us today. In Jesus' name, amen.